Okay, Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine in three, two, one. It's the Muppet Show with your host, John Denver. Yay! You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi everybody, I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Ma- Welcome to the Dune Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. It's been a while, huh? <laughs> I am Rish Outfield, and this is episode one. No, it's not episode one. <laughs> Episode one. Welcome. Today we have a, another champion of our most recent Broken Mirror Story contest. This, today's story is called Saying Goodbye by Christopher Monroe. Munzy. Munzy, Munzy, Munzy. Wow. Hey, off the top of your head, what other episode? what other stories have we done by Munzy? I'm pretty sure he was the one who wrote the one about death. What was it called? The one about death and Michelle Jenkins? That's it. Death and Michelle Jenkins. I think that's the only one of his that we've done so far. Here is story number two by Munzee. Rhymes with funzy. It does. <laughs> hey. Oh, no, no, not funzy. Yes. Uh, uh, hey, remind people what the theme to the Broken Mirror story. Or the, was it theme? The I prompt? We call it a premise, so maybe premise. a prompt would work, too. Uh, yes, the premise that you used to imagine your story with was the phone rings in the middle of the night. Person on the end of the line only says one word, but it is enough. Zoom chink! All right, and so this was one of the stories that was voted highest. Yes, this is one of our top uh, four stories is what we're doing, and this is... We are now. This will now be our third one that we have run. They're not going in any particular order. You know, we all win on the Dean Steve magazine. Yes, the only losers are those not listening. Right. Wait. I think you got that wrong. Well, that sucked. <laughs> the only losers are the ones behind the mic. Ah, there you go. But And who produced today's episode? Today's episode was produced for us by a brand new volunteer. You may remember her voice from before, singing the beautiful Dune Steve Ditty. Oh, nice. Today's story was produced by Melissa Hills, who has also done several pieces of art for the show. So as we can see, she is an all-around Renaissance woman. And she wears glasses. I believe so. So that rules, really. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you, Melissa, for producing this. And uh, anybody is free to do as she did. That's true. And wear yeah. glasses. Everyone's free to wear sunscreen. Oh, that's right. In Portland, all of the hottest girls wear glasses. I'd heard that. <laughs> there, there's a place where the uh, the dream of the 90s never died. Yeah, it's alive Live, today. I it's alive today? Okay. I don't remember how the words went exactly, but I do remember the line about the glasses. All right, well, then... Very important. Do you know anything about Christopher Monroe? Does he prefer to be called Munzee? Is that like a nickname for his friends, or is that a pen name? I don't know. Christopher Monroe is an author slash actor slash comedian from Calgary, Alberta, whose fiction has appeared previously in the Steve, Way of the Buffalo, and Journey Into podcasts, as well as numerous other places around the web, and whose debut novel, Broken Escalator, is available now in ebook and as a podcast at patiobooks.com. He likes words and ideas, and occasionally has trouble seeing the difference between horror and comedy, which has led to unexpectedly amusing stories and absolutely terrifying stand up sets. All right, so on with the story. Saying Goodbye by Christopher Monroe. She was never more beautiful than she was arriving home from the funeral. The dress was new, and she was still somehow managing to hold her head high. I wasn't surprised. She'd always been the strong one, the proud one, always putting others before herself and taking care of the people around her. 
She'd probably spent the whole funeral assuring friends and family she was fine. She'd be fine, never letting a trace of grief show on her face, giving comfort rather than receiving it. Had she cried? Had she cried even a single tear? Which had proven, in the end, to be greater, her grief at the loss of her husband or her need to project a picture of strength for the gathered mourners? I suspected it was the latter, seeing her standing at the door waving back at whoever had driven her home. She was too composed for a woman who'd spent her afternoon crying. She'd been through so much, but she wouldn't let it show, not in a million years. Not while she'd planned the funeral and not while she attended it. She'd tied her hair back the way she always did it when she wanted to project professionalism. And a tight smile was still on her lips. Not her best smile, or her most natural, but not a bad effort, considering. In fact, all things considered, she was maintaining her composure surprisingly well. But none of this surprised me. It had always been her way. Whenever she went through times of trouble, she needed more than anything not to look weak. As though acting strong could be the source of the actual strength she needed. There had been times when I worried that this approach to life wasn't a healthy one. But I loved her for it all the same. Whoever had brought her home drove away, and she turned from the doorway, allowing it to swing shut behind her as she walked down the front hallway toward the kitchen. She made it nearly halfway before she had to stop resting a hand on the wall and staring at the hardwood floor, taking deep, focused breaths. I wondered if that would be her time, but after a minute, she had herself back under control well enough to make it the rest of the way to the kitchen. I watched her run the tap, splash cold water on her face once, then again, then fill a coffee mug from it. She sipped the drink, then looked down, noticing the picture on the mug's front, the cover of an old Pink Floyd album, wish you were here. She'd never liked that album. Never particularly liked Pink Floyd. I'd always teased her that she hadn't done enough drugs in college to appreciate them properly. I'd bought the mug at HMV on a whim while shopping for DVDs months before. I liked Floyd. Wish You Were Here was one of my favorite albums. The mug had been waiting there, in the kitchen, the whole time. Sitting by the sink because I'd forgotten to put it away the last time I did the dishes like a ticking time bomb of emotional baggage waiting to explode. And she couldn't stop staring at it. Her hands began to tremble, and before she could set the mug back down on what had once been our kitchen counter, she dropped it, both of us watching as it fell in what seemed like slow motion, shattering against the kitchen floor, destroyed, never to return. It was a stupid coffee mug of a band she'd never liked, and its loss was enough. One second she was staring at the mug, the next pieces of it were scattered across the floor, and she was leaning against the kitchen counter with both hands, her whole body shaking as she let loose something halfway between a sob and a scream, making sounds I'd had no idea her small body was capable of, and I just watched her the whole time, watched as her tears kept coming and coming, as the mascara ran down her face in violent black streaks watched as she could no longer support her weight enough to lean, and she sank down, knees pressed to her chest, back against the kitchen wall, screaming and weeping, and finally giving voice to the sorrow brought by the loss of the man she'd woken up next to for eleven years. They say that outpourings of grief, no matter how heartfelt, bring no satisfaction to the departed, or if they don't say that, they should, because it's true. I'm not sure how long she sat there. It felt like a lifetime, but I was in no position to judge. Having nothing to do and being confined to the house as I was, time had grown harder and harder for me to estimate as the days wore on. But eventually, the sobbing did let up. And when it did, it was even worse. Because she didn't stand back up. She just kept sitting there, head resting against the kitchen wall, staring off and to her left at something only she seemed able to see. Her eyes were glassy and vacant, as though she'd used up her last measure of emotional stability at the funeral, and now that nobody she knew of was watching, she was grateful for the opportunity to collapse into catatonia in the privacy of her own home. It was as if she'd been switched off, as if something inside her 
had also died, some vital spark without which she saw no reason to get up off the floor. I wanted to hold her more at that moment than I ever had over the course of our life together, wanted to tell her that, while things seemed worse than anything she'd ever known, they would get better with time. I wanted to be there for her, to give strength and support to a woman who'd given so much of both to me. I wanted a lot of things, but I couldn't have any of them, because I was dead, and all I could do was watch. I'd been too young for a heart attack, by which I mean I'd been exactly the correct age to have what turned out to be a very fatal heart attack. I did not, however, know this until midway through my lunch date with an old friend from university. I hadn't seen Jared in close to three years. He'd moved to Toronto shortly after finishing his degree and rarely came back out west. And I'd been looking forward to the lunch since he'd contacted me via Facebook to see if I was available for something while he was in town. We'd been close in school, and while we'd drifted apart a little in the decade and change since we'd graduated, I still quite liked the guy. He had a free, easy wit, and the kind of laugh that was contagious. I was looking forward to catching up a little, hearing his stories about life in the big T.O., and sharing my own about married life and a suburban home in a neighborhood I never would have thought I'd wind up in. So I changed a couple of appointments around, and we made plans to meet on Friday afternoon at the Chili's near the hotel where he was staying. The artichoke dip was okay, but the company was better. Jared had lost none of the charm for which he'd been so well-liked in university, and graduating and establishing himself within his field had only added another layer of self-assuredness to a man who'd already had an easy way with people. He'd spent the previous three years doing environmental impact studies for the government of Ontario in advance of major construction projects, and somehow managed to make the work a hilarious topic of conversation. The way he described it, the provincial government was in a perpetual state of near collapse, with bureaucratic inertia and political ambition bordering on hubristic in a state of constant simmering cold war that prevented, in his words... The handful of people within the government who actually do work from ever finishing anything. By the time he finished his story about surveying land for a potential future wind farm, I was laughing so hard my chest hurt, and tears were running down my face as I clutched my numb arm and begged him to stop. <laughs> Please! <laughs> I told him, Stop! Stop! I can barely breathe! <laughs> He just sat, smiling the indulgent smile I remembered from our school days together, the one he got when he knew he'd really sold an anecdote, when he could afford to just sit back and soak up the attention he'd earned. He sat and smiled and soaked it in, and he allowed me to catch my breath, that I might bring him up to speed on what I'd been doing in the years since we'd seen each other last. Except, for whatever reason, my breath refused to be caught. I felt as though a weight were pressing down on my chest, one that wouldn't be dislodged however hard I tried. I still didn't understand fully what was happening to me, as I had no frame of reference at the age of 36 for my body betraying me out of the blue. But something in the back of my mind was telling me that whatever was happening, it was very, very bad. Bad enough, apparently, to wipe the smile from Jared's face as he watched me struggle. Are you okay? He asked. <laughs> fine. Fine. I replied. Fine. I got some heartburn or something. I'm just going to... I'll be back in a minute. I'm not sure where I'd planned to go. To splash water on my face, maybe, or just a lap or two of the restaurant to get my blood flowing again. But it doesn't really matter where I'd planned to go, since I never made it there. Instead... I pushed my chair back from the table, got to my feet, and died. I wasn't dead when my head hit the corner of the table. I know that because it hurt like hell. But I suspect I was by the time my body hit the floor. Jared, understandably, lost it, bolting to his feet and rushing to see if I was okay. And the whole place erupted into a flurry of activity, everyone trying to get a look, or to push the people trying to get a look away to give me room to breathe or looking for somebody who knew CPR. Jared called an ambulance, but by the time they arrived, I'd been dead for close to eight minutes. Still, the paramedics tried. I appreciate how hard they tried.
But eventually, they gave up on the idea that the lump of meat laying on the floor could ever be turned back into a human being, tossed a sheet over it, loaded it into an ambulance, and drove away, leaving me behind as everyone else in the restaurant started to clear out. Seeing no good reason to stay, I left too, heading in the direction of home. Getting home was tough, in so much as it took a while before I realized I wasn't going to be able to get into my car. And once that realization came, I had a very long walk to take, cursing myself the whole way for not having died someplace closer to home. She was home when I arrived, reading while she watched TV, without a care in the world. I'd never understood how she managed to do both without tuning one or the other out, but she'd assured me, through our time together, that she managed just fine. I wondered how she managed to look so relaxed, considering what had happened. But thinking about it, I quickly realized she hadn't been told. My meat was still at the hospital being processed, and they hadn't gotten around to calling and letting her know her husband was dead. It had yet to occur to them. I couldn't tell her, for obvious reasons. Even if she'd been able to see and hear me, I wouldn't have been able to tell her goodbye. Didn't have it in me and I felt like a goodbye was the very least I owed her after all the years of joy she'd given me. So I sat on the chair across from the couch on which she reclined and watched her read and watch TV, relaxed and at peace, enjoying her tranquility even as I knew it couldn't last. And it didn't last. It was only around 20 minutes before her cell phone started ringing from the kitchen table, and while I'd love to have been able to scream at her not to answer it, I couldn't do anything of the kind. Hello? She told it. And then after a moment... Yes, this is she. She didn't say a word after that. But as she listened, her whole body stiffened, made tight by the tension of buried grief. She nodded to herself as whoever had called spoke to her. And once they'd finished, she took a couple of long, deep breaths and replied, Yes, yes, of course I can come and claim the body. Thank you. I'll be down as quickly as I can. I appreciate that. I'll be there soon. She hung up the phone, found her purse, slipped one into the other, and headed to the door to run her newfound, unexpected errand. And through it all, she didn't shed a single tear. Because she was the strong one, and now she must have felt like she needed to be stronger than ever. I could see all this in her face. I'd known her long enough to recognize her visual cues, and I knew she wouldn't cry anytime soon. Until my meat was safely in the ground and she no longer had to deal with the details of its internal, she wouldn't consider tears something she had time for. And she didn't cry either. Not until she'd made it through the funeral and all the way back home to enjoy her emotional collapse in peace and privacy. She did eventually get up off the kitchen floor, of course. She just needed a few moments to have things out. A few moments, in her case, being close to two hours. I watched the whole time as she sat unmoving and seeing her in so much pain, and knowing there was nothing I could do to lend her any comfort would have killed me if I hadn't been dead already. I wished more than once for the power to look away, and I hated that weakness within myself. But I couldn't look away, so I just kept torturing myself with her grief at my passing. Finally, she staggered to the bedroom, collapsed face down on the bed, and slipped into unconsciousness. After the time she'd spent organizing my funeral and putting on a brave face for friends and family the past weeks, I'm sure the sleep was a welcome relief. I could have used some relief myself. However, not having a body, sleep was impossible. So I stayed where I was, watching her as she fitfully slept, wishing I could wake her, comfort her, tell her I still existed, if not in a form I could understand. And as I did, I became angrier and angrier that a system could be in place where I return home after my death to see my wife and then find myself unable to do anything to make my presence felt once I arrived. I'd never been a religious man, but it didn't seem right. My wife was right in front of me in a state of nervous collapse, and I couldn't do anything. I wanted to scream at the injustice of it, but having no mouth, I could not. Instead, I watched her until I could bear it no more, and then I returned to the kitchen. It looked much the same, 
the shards of ceramic mug still littering the floor. I suppose I should have been grateful that she'd remembered to turn off the sink. She'd been pretty preoccupied. But I didn't have the sense of reflective irony for it at the time. Instead, I just stared, dumbly, at the place where once I'd spent so much of my living time, and where I'd never live again. Eventually, my attention drifted to the pieces of cup on the ground, the portion still intact with the picture of two men shaking hands, one of them on fire, staring up at me from its place on the floor. And the realization hit me. I would never listen to the Pink Floyd album Wish You Were Here again. I didn't listen to it that often, but it really was a remarkable piece of music, one that was lost to me in death. Forever. She'd never listened to it without me around. She'd never shared my love of the band, and so the last time I'd listened to it really was the last time. It was the specificity of the experience lost, I think, that allowed me to internalize what had happened. I'd never listen to Pink Floyd again, and I'd never again put my hands on the woman sleeping in the next room. My favorite coffee mug was destroyed beyond repair, but that didn't matter because I'd been destroyed beyond repair and I'd never drink coffee again. Nothing I enjoyed doing was relevant any longer because I no longer had the physical presence that doing required. It wasn't a dream or something I'd eventually snap out of. I was really dead. I didn't like that realization at all, and moreover, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it. If some part of me survived my death, but that part couldn't partake in the world in which it existed, how should it spend its time? And for how long would I be trapped here? Was this what hell was? Watching your loved ones go about their lives, never knowing you're there, and never being able to reach out to them? If it was a hell, it was a damned effective one. I wished I'd been religious. It would at least have given me some sort of philosophical underpinning for the questions running through whatever I was using instead of a head. As I was considering this, I reached out to the fragment of mug still there on the floor, more out of instinct than any concrete plan, and attempted to pick it up. I felt foolish as I did it, knowing I had no body with which to grasp an object, but I did it all the same. Imagine my surprise then, when the shard of cup moved. It didn't move far, to be sure, not more than half an inch, but it absolutely did move. And I was certain I had been the one who'd moved it. I don't know why this surprised me, but I was shocked nonetheless. With nothing to reach out to the piece of cup with, I'd reached out anyway, and I'd moved it. I'd moved a piece of cup, which meant I could move other things. With time and practice, I could move things in much larger ways, which meant I could eventually contact her again and give her the sense of closure she so obviously needed. And that's how I spent the first part of my afterlife. It wasn't a quick process, and it wasn't easy to learn how to do it, but I gradually became better and better at affecting the physical world. I started small, obviously, with small things. Pencils, paper clips, and whatever else was left lying around the house that I could practice my concentration on. In this, her grief at my passing made things easier, as she had much less interest in keeping the place tidy than she'd had when I was alive. As days turned into weeks, more and more things were laying around for me to concentrate on. And between that and the fact that I couldn't bear to watch her suffering in front of me, not even knowing I was there to act as her witness, I got a lot of practice. At first, the effects were negligible. I'd moved the piece of cup without touching it, but as far as I could tell, that had just been an expression of extreme emotion, and repeating the feat was not a thing that would happen without what turned out to be an enormous amount of time and effort. But as days turned into weeks, and then eventually into months, I did start to manage it. Paper clips twitched, then vibrated, then dragged themselves across what once had been my desk under no power other than that of my will. I was thrilled the first time it happened to know that my hard work was finally meeting with traces of tangible success. I still had no idea specifically how I'd use my newfound ability to interact with the world around me to tell her all the things I hadn't told her in life. But I knew 
that with time, I'd figure something out, and in the meanwhile, I was working on the skill set I'd surely need to make contact once I figured out a way to do so. I was making progress. That was enough. If I'd paid attention, I would have seen that she was making progress too. For days after the funeral, she rarely left the bedroom, slipping in and out of fitful sleep and frequently waking up screaming. But as time wore on, she got up and out more often. At first, it was just to shuffle into the kitchen and fix something to eat. But after a few days, she was up and around again, showering, dressing, and occasionally leaving the house. She wasn't going back to work. The hours she was gone weren't right for it to be work. But she was going out, and that was something. I tried to follow her the first time she went, but something prevented me from getting any farther than the front yard, and I never thought to question what it was. I should have questioned it. I know I should have. I'd always been a person with a healthy intellectual curiosity in life, but something about the fact that I was incapable of traveling farther than the front yard of my home just felt right in a way I couldn't express, but that I understood on an instinctive level. So I returned to the house and let her go wherever it was she was going. She'd return in good time after all, and anyway, her absence gave me time to practice. By the time she did start going back to work, I was routinely moving paper clips and had moved on to coffee mugs and plates. This was more difficult, both due to the weight of the objects being moved and due to the fact that much more care needed to be taken as I practiced. Losing control of a paperclip merely led to a lost paperclip after all. While smashing a plate would leave behind a mess, I had no hope of cleaning up before she found it, nor the chance to offer an explanation as to how it had gotten there. And that was something that could never, ever be allowed. She couldn't know there was another presence in the house until I figured out a way to contact her properly. It would only cause her pain. So the fact that she was going back to work made things easier for me. I'd practice moving larger and larger things while she was out, and call it a day when she got home. Then I'd watch her read, or watch TV, and I'd yearn to touch her the way I'd once done so casually. When she eventually went to bed, I'd get back to work moving objects around the house with greater and greater ease. And it did get easy. I had plenty of time to spend practicing after all, between the fact that I couldn't leave the house and the fact that, being dead, I no longer needed sleep. Between those two factors, I likely spent upward of 18 hours a day learning to move things with my will. And any time you devote 18 hours a day to practicing something, you'll become very good at it, indeed. I had the time. I had the motivation, and before long I had the skills I needed to contact her and tell her I was okay. What I lacked was a plan for how to do so. While I could write her a letter and hide it somewhere in the house, I wanted some method of contact where we could truly converse. But while moving objects was now within my range of abilities, creating sound still eluded me, and I couldn't see any way to even begin trying to change that. So I was gradually resigning myself to the fact that a letter would be the best I'd be able to manage. A love letter, perhaps. One in which I told her how important she'd been to me, how much I'd treasured her during the time we'd been together, in which I told her how deeply I regretted being torn away from her, but reassured her that she'd be okay, in which I told her how strong and funny and odd and affecting and beautiful she was, body and soul, and how lucky I'd been to have her in my world, however briefly. A letter in which I said all the things that, while I had said them to her in life, I hadn't said nearly often enough. Say all that, and then goodbye. It would lack the intimacy of a conversation, but it would be something, and I could only hope it would be enough. Letters are okay. Given enough time, I could have talked myself into believing a letter was appropriate, especially since, without another option, I was very motivated to believe. It would have wound up being a letter had I not received that phone call. She wasn't home when it happened, obviously. If she'd been home, she would have gotten the phone herself, and I might still be trying to get the wording right on that letter. But she wasn't, and when the phone rang, I was levitating the chair in our living room and impressing myself with how good at it I'd become. It wasn't a large chair, just a lightweight IKEA-produced number. But still, I was levitating a chair using nothing but willpower. How cool is that? When the phone rang, the chair came crashing to the ground, 
and I would have jumped from the surprise if I'd had a body with which to do so. I winced, hoped the chair wasn't damaged in a way she'd notice when she got home, and I rately grabbed the phone. Not the best time, I said into it without thinking. Uh, who is this? A bewildered voice on the other end of the line responded. And that was when I realized I'd answered the phone, and whoever had called could hear me. I'd done it more reflexively than reflectively, because answering the phone when it rings is just what you do. But whoever was calling could hear me. He shouldn't have been able to. I hadn't been able to make a sound in the many months since my death, but something about the addition of a layer of technology between us had made my thoughts audible. I might not have been able to speak, but it seemed I could manipulate the workings of a telephone into a rough approximation. It still wasn't the perfect way to contact her, but it was a hell of a lot more personal than a letter. This only took seconds to process, but it was apparently long enough for the pause on the phone to become awkward because the man on the other end of the line spoke again before I could respond to his question. H hello He asked. Are you still there? Who is this? Peterson Residence, I lied. For whom are you calling? Oh, he said. I'm sorry, I must have misdialed. No, no trouble at all. You have a good day. When the phone rang again a few seconds later, I ignored it. Finally, I had a way to contact her where we could truly communicate. The hows were figured out and all I had to do was establish what it was I wanted to say. If I'd had eyes, I would have cried. I'd been watching the woman I loved mourn me from what seemed an insurmountable distance for far too long, and I was finally going to be able to reach out to her. I would figure out what I wanted to say, call her, say it, and all would be well. It seems like such a minor thing, making one simple phone call, but to me, it was momentous and the prospect filled me with joy beyond my ability to express. So much joy, in fact, that it never occurred to me to wonder why men with voices I didn't recognize were phoning my wife in the middle of the day. It took a long while to work out what I wanted to tell her, but I managed that there was existence that continued after death, for starters, and that due to this, I was still there with her, that I was sorry for the pain I'd caused her by dying so suddenly, and how even after death, I loved her. I tried to assemble my thoughts in a way that would adequately sum up my feelings, make her understand how much I'd cherished each moment we'd had together, and how she'd been the most important part of my life. However hard I tried, though, words didn't seem like they'd ever sum up our lives together. But they were all I had, so I kept trying. As day turned to evening, and then to night, I grew more and more resigned to the fact that the perfect phrasing would forever remain outside my grasp, and as I reflected, I realized that that was okay. I loved her, and she I, and we would speak to one another. If my words were artless, the love behind them would still be apparent, especially to someone as close to me as she was. I would trust myself, call her, and let the conversation go where it may. By this point, it was completely dark outside the living room window, and I realized I'd spent the whole of the day considering the phrasing of a brief conversation. At some point, while I was lost in thought, she must have gotten home, gone through her nightly routine, and headed to bed, and she was likely already fast asleep. She'd always gone to bed earlier than I had. I'd been the night owl of the house. I was tempted to leave it be until morning, but I'd already waited months while I figured out how to contact her, and I couldn't wait one moment longer. So, late or no, that night I reached out to her from beyond the grave. Her cell phone rang, called from the home phone in our living room, and then it rang again. When it rang a third time, I worried that she'd set it to vibrate. I don't know what I would have said had it gone through to the machine, and I was very slightly frightened by the prospect of learning. She didn't normally mute her phone, but in the months since my passing, she might have started. Fortunately, I didn't worry long because she did, finally, pick up. Hello? She asked. And at that moment, it all came crashing down around me, and I realized there was nothing I could say. It was the tone of her voice, I think, that did it. She sounded half asleep, to be sure, and confused to be receiving a call so late at night, but she didn't sound destroyed. 
I'd expected to hear the grief in her voice as she spoke, but it was no longer there. Even with just one word, I could tell that. And, as I reflected upon it, I supposed there was no reason for her to sound destroyed. I'd watched her, after all, go from paralyzed by sorrow to eventually leaving the bedroom, and kept watching as she'd gone back to work and gradually stitched her social life back together. At first, she'd wallowed, as everyone does when confronted with great loss, and it seemed like she'd never recover. But that had been months ago, possibly more than a year. She'd mourned me, but finally she'd found a way to let me go, to find the closure she needed without my help. It shouldn't have surprised me. Is what people do, after all. But it did. I'd been so wrapped up in figuring out a way to contact her that I'd not noticed her as she'd quietly dealt with her grief and gotten on with her life. Hadn't noticed, or hadn't wanted to notice. And what initially had been an attempt to help her find peace after my death suddenly felt oddly... selfish. Why contact her, after all that time? To remind her of what she'd lost and push myself back into the front of her mind? She'd finally moved on, gotten on with her life, with friends and work and things that brought her joy, and I was calling her in the middle of the night to remind her that her husband was dead? Even if she was glad to hear from me, what could I possibly offer her in the state I was in? Phone conversations with a man who once had held her at night struck me as a pretty poor consolation prize. So what? Say goodbye and let her go back to mourning me? Set back the grieving process I didn't know how long? just because I had to talk to her one last time? What right did I have? As much as I hated admitting it to myself, I had no right at all. I was dead. She was alive. And I had to let her live a life that had no room in it for the ghost of a dead husband. I'd convinced myself I was doing this for her, and perhaps at first contacting her might have helped. But as I'd been developing the ability to place phone calls... She'd been developing, too, and it had become the call itself that risked plunging her back into the abyss of grief. What kind of man would I be if I did that to the woman I loved, just because I needed to talk to her one last time? Not any kind I'd ever want to be. I heard the faint sound of her snoring coming from the phone. While waiting for me to respond, she must have fallen back asleep. And that was okay. It was okay because, while I would have liked to have had more time with her, more time in general, I understood that that wasn't how it worked. I'd had a life, and it had been a good one. And it was over. It didn't end too soon, and I didn't die too young. I died at exactly the right time because I died at the end of my life. And that was just the way the universe was laid out. My opinions on the details were irrelevant. And I honestly did have a good run while it lasted. I'd done work that I enjoyed, had friends that made me laugh so hard I couldn't focus my eyes, and loved a woman who, even after my death, had displayed strength of purpose and character that inspired me. She'd managed, after all, to let go of grief and loss and sorrow and to cherish what was good without clinging to what she couldn't have back. And the time had come for me to do the same. I may not have liked it, but if the woman I loved could find a way to live with it, I was sure I could. So I hung up the phone, let go, and finally walked into the light. And now a word about today's story. Hello, this is Christopher Monroe, author of Saying Goodbye. When the Broken Mirror event was announced, I only had a really vague notion of what I wanted to do for it. I wanted the word to be hello, and I wanted it to be the person placing the call who heard it rather than the person receiving it, because I liked the idea of it just being the connection that says all that needs saying, rather than the specific word. So, I had that moment in mind from the start. Beyond that, though, I didn't have a clue how I was going to get there. The coffee mug mentioned is a real thing in my house, and I really do love that Pink Floyd record. And looking at it, something clicked, and I started thinking about small moments of connection that you make without even realizing it. And that train of thought eventually led me to a ghost story about the grieving process. 
I wound up writing all of saying goodbye in about three days, and I'm really pleased with how it went. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And we're back. <laughs> all right. Hey, that was good stuff. Uh, is there a, is there a song called say Saying Goodbye? Uh, is there a Saying Goodbye song? That we well, there's sing? that uh, Saying Goodbye song from the Muppets. You remember that? We watched it. Uh. Saying goodbye. Why is it sad? Are you guys singing again? Etc. I don't remember the words to it, unfortunately. La, 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 la. Big, why are there so many songs about rainbows? La, I don't know. There's a lot of them, isn't there? Like, Somewhere Over the Rainbow and... Uh, Pretty much anything Erasure ever recorded. <laughs> Full-on double rainbow. <laughs> uh, didn't we originally ask uh, all the winners uh, a series of questions? We did, yes. We and have... they had to answer these questions three to cross the bridge of, right. of death. We have Munzee's responses to these questions. And we will read them. Why do we always come here? Okay. Imagine, if you will, that I am asking Munzee these three questions. How much of this story came from the prompt Big and Rish gave, and how much came from a previous story or idea you had thought of in the past? This story came entirely from the prompt. When I heard what the prompt was, I immediately wanted to do a story where it was the person receiving the call who said the one word, rather than the other way around, and then reverse-engineered a story to fit that notion. Huh. Cheater. <laughs> okay. Well, how did you decide what the single word spoken over the phone would be? Did you start with that word and go from there, or did you have to shoehorn the phone call into the tail as you were going along? The actual word, I think, was less relevant in this story than the fact that she'd spoken at all. The ghost took the message he needed from the tone of voice more than what was actually said. So in this case, I suspect I could have gotten similar results with a different word choice. I just used hello because that's a pretty natural way to receive a phone call. Although, what would see Burns Montgomery Burns? Ahoy, hoy. <laughs> So, hoi, hoi. I think I spoke over you there. It's all right. We don't need it. You were a champion, my friend. Now, how confident were you in entering the contest that you would be one of the winners? Did you have a feeling while writing it, when it was done, or before writing it? Ever. Jealous? I was pretty confident when I entered the contest that I'd do well. I'm quite proud of this story. It's a sturdy little ghost story, and it deals with two of the major obsessions I seem to keep going back to in my writing. The supernatural and my obsession with my own mortality. So obviously it's got a place in my heart for that reason alone. I'm glad to hear you folks have enjoyed it as well. Hey, thank you, la, 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 la. Munzee, for answering those three questions la, la, musically la, la. as you did. And thanks for everybody that entered the contest. I, I believe we have one more piss poor story to come. That's right. Donate to the show. And <laughs> <laughs> speaking of contests, we've got a contest that we announced in the last episode. We're going to be doing that drawing in a few minutes. That's right, in a few minutes. Uh, before we go any further, though, we had ought to do the cast list. Oh, is there a cast list? No, there isn't, but I'm pretty sure we can easily come up with the names of the folks that were in it. Whole only one. four. So, obviously, the main character, who, Carl, do we remember his name? He was dead. His name doesn't matter. Oh, well, the main character was played by Rish Outfield. The character of the friend who came to uh, visit and killed him. <laughs> and also the guy on the other line of the phone when he accidentally picks it up. We're both played by Big Anklevich. The voice of the wife was played by Melissa Hills, our producer. And I think that's all there was. Excellent. Who, who did the music? Oh, right. Uh, yeah, this was an unusual story in that... Music was composed for the story. Uh, Melissa had a friend who was a, had music chops. And, uh, yeah, she had this guy 
compose a soundtrack to go along with this, the reading of the story. And this guy's name was Elsewhere. That's really amazing that somebody would have composed music for the show. I mean, I, obviously, Melissa did that in the past with our lovely theme song, which I don't know we've ever played again. And this guy's name is Mustafa. Uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that. It's Mustafa with two A's at the end. You say both A's like separately or do you just make it like a longer A? How do you do that? Do you know? I do not know. I like the extra A just because it's creepy. What, what, however you say it, this guy rocks or, or girl, dude. I guy. guess, yeah, that's possible. You don't this, know. It's this person really is uh, a friend of the show. Yeah, pretty awesome. I, I was excited and I thought the music went really well with the story itself and it scored it in a way that we've never had before you know we take we've always taken pre-made songs and put them on there and sometimes they go well sometimes they don't but they hardly ever go at certain points or pump up and then slow down and etc that goes along with the reading which this was the first time we ever had that and it was pretty cool i thought it's too bad we don't know more musicians i know that that's really cool. And the sad thing is I, I didn't realize that we had somebody scoring the story until just now. And uh, I think I probably would have paid a lot more attention to the music. Had I, as it stands, I kept thinking, wow, the music's really nice in this because it, like you said, it would rise when the a drama of the story rose. But I just assumed, you know, that Melissa was just really good with how she laid it under the story. Uh -huh. If you wouldn't mind, in the show notes, put a link to this guy's website or something. So if someone else wants to hire him or let him know that he's actually a woman, see if he's available for something, they can go there. Yeah, that'd be cool. I will uh, make sure that I have a link from uh, Melissa that I can put in there. All right. So the story itself. I liked when Patrick Swayze made the penny go up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I think I had an extra feeling or liking or whatever you want to say for this story because just, was it last year or the year before, I wrote a kind of similar story uh, about a guy who had died and was, you know, he was haunting <laughs> his house uh, or a house, I should say, because it wasn't really his, but uh, to try and prevent something from happening that would keep him from forever tied to the ghost world instead of being able to move on. And I don't know, there was there was a lot of similarities in this story and that story. And that made you like the story more? Which I, th I think it did. Could it have had the opposite effect? I, I suppose if it was a poorly done story, I might be like, ah, oh, stupid story. It's kind of like mine, but this one sucks and I hate it. Oh, okay. Or something. I don't know. Uh, but since it was well done, I guess I, I kind of appreciated it. Yeah, I, mean, I think the difference between this story and my story was mine was more high concept. If you remember that term from our screenwriting class, this one was more of a steady ghost story. It didn't have a lot to explain you just kind of knew, okay, there's a ghost and you're trying to learn to manipulate stuff and be a more of a poltergeisty ghost. Muncie said that he has a, I don't remember what his word was, uh, let's say preoccupation with death. Uh huh. His own mortality. With his own mortality. How about you? How often do you think about, oh, gee, I'm going to die someday? <laughs> or, oh, gee, what if I died? I think about it way too often, to tell you the truth. Just the other day, the thing is I work in news, which makes it hard not to think about death. Because if it bleeds. It leads, that's right. It's the way it is. I mean, we don't... If somebody dies of unnatural causes, <laughs> we'll report on it. It's something that basically makes it get into the show. There's a car accident that's bad enough that someone is injured severely or dies, then it's a car accident we'll report on. If it's a fender bender, well, we don't care because I guess there's too many of those or, or whatever. If somebody has a heart attack or whatever, we don't report on that. But if someone's murdered or there's some kind of a horrible accident, then we report on it. It's in the show. It's something that we talk about. And God, sometimes it can get depressing. It can get really overwhelming sometimes. Our company actually has a 
phone number that you can call if you feel overwhelmed by the nature of the things that you're reporting on every day. You can call this number and basically there's a shrink on the other end of the line that will talk to you and try and help you to deal with your feelings uh, that you're having. And yeah, not too long ago there was that, uh, the big news story was the Newtown, Connecticut shooting. And as a uh, precaution, our news director just announced, hey, by the way, there is this phone number. I know that this is a really upsetting story. So I'm gonna, uh, I'll am i send out an email to everybody with that number in there. If you feel you need to call this number, you know, make sure to do it because, you know, we don't want you falling to pieces. And there have been times where I thought, gosh, maybe I need to call that number. Holy crap. How could, ugh. Like just the other day, there was a car accident. And then th- this is like two stories. And these aren't even like all the stories. This is like two little quick stories that were reported on. Car accident number one, person gets hit and dies in this car accident. Separate story, guy's riding his bike to work. Somebody didn't scrape the frost off of their windshield. This person hit the guy on the bike, knocked him into a train and kills this guy. It's the kind of stuff that is really hard to handle. And when you think about just how tenuous life can be and how random and haphazard these kind of things are this guy's bike to work a thousand times maybe and then one day oh somebody forgot to freaking defrost their window and now he's dead you know you never know and that's one of those things that i think about actually a whole lot because i drive a long ways to get to work and a long ways to get back home that gives me that much extra time to do something stupid, or have somebody else do something stupid to me, and that's it. So yeah, I I think about it way more than probably even the average person because of, I guess, my line of work. But maybe just because I'm also a depressing downer of a person, too. (laughs) So what do you do to get that out of your head? What do you do to uh, compensate for that obviously it's not calling the in-house shrink yeah i haven't called the in-house shrink yet i don't really know generally i guess you just get busy you know what i mean you do something else and your mind will let it drift back to the back of you know your consciousness so that it, it isn't there bothering you at the front and maybe that's the difference that you know the people who finally fall apart can't let it drift further back or whatever it, it remains in the front and they can't think of anything else and so far that hasn't happened to me i i still am able to push it to the back or let it slide to the back i guess is probably a better way to put it because i have other things that i got to do i got to hurry up and do this and do that and that's one other thing with news it's fast-paced kind of stuff that stuff is due right away. And you've got a whole lineup of stuff that's due right away. And so you just got to get on it and get it done. It's kind of like working in a factory or something. You know, you got to twist those bolts really fast as they go by on the conveyor belt or else, you know, if they get past, you're in trouble because then the card falls apart later. And causes that accident. <laughs> there you go. I guess it kind of helps that it's that way too. But yeah, it, it, it's sometimes hard. I don't know. Well, being a creative person, a writer, are you ever able to exercise those personal demons by writing about it? By writing about a loved one's death or your own insecurities or your own fears I, about the world? I think that I do that fairly often when I actually get around to actually doing the writing. I, you always complain and call me a dark-hearted, uh, evil person because my stories tend to end very badly. You know, I, I I kill the infant or I kill the main character or whatever it is at the end of the story. And maybe that has something to do with it. I don't really know for sure. They say that art can have that cathartic ability for the people who read it and the people who uh, create it, I guess. So maybe I am able to use it to exercise. I don't consciously do it, but I think, you know, it's possible that it comes from that. Well, I, I, for me, it certainly does. A lot of the things that I am 
afraid of or a lot of the things that I feel, I can write about it in a journal. You can put them as your Facebook status or you can tweet them or whatever. But yeah, a lot of times I put myself into a story and an experience that I had that was upsetting or a, you know an experience where it could have gone one way and luckily it didn't but you explore what would it have been like if it had gone that way and it seems like I mean I don't know Chris very well but it seems like there's a lot of him in this story and uh, you know his feelings and fears and maybe he imagined his own death and what would happen afterward for this story I mean I, obviously if he said in the author's note <laughs> that he imagined his own death and what came afterward, then, you know, that was redundant, what I just said. Okay, but, well, maybe I'll cut it out. But I really do enjoy the ability to put my feelings or my fears or my insecurities on a character who isn't me in a story. You know, imagine an old man. Imagine what I will be like as an old man. You know, if, if the chain of events <laughs> does not change... This is the old man I will become. Things like that. I, I don't know. That's a, a really magical part of writing is speaking something that's in the back of your mind, something that you don't really dare say to another person, but you dare have a fictional character say it uh -huh. and you suddenly feel a little bit better. You feel like I, I've talked about it with somebody. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen that Woody Allen movie, Deconstructing Harry, where he's the uh, writer and he keeps like writing all about his life, like with thinly veiled, like basically changing the names of the people have been changed to protect the innocent, but the guilty is named haven't been changed. Uh, no, he, he just changes his stuff slightly. And like everybody knows, like he writes about having sex with somebody like in his grandma's closet or something like that. And then he puts the story out and everybody, you know, that are friends with him read it, and then they immediately know who he's talking about and they get all upset with him all the time and it's got all sorts of problems because of that. I have seen the movie, but I don't remember that. It makes me want to rent the movie again. There was that show Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip uh -huh. that only went the one season it right. got canceled, but that was an Aaron Sorkin show and he basically wrote the Matthew Perry character as him and Sarah Paulson played this blonde religious actress that he had a relationship with and it came out early early on in the run of the show that sarah paulson was based on Kristen chenoweth and an actual experience when they were in a relationship and she let her religious beliefs just completely f up their relationship and he was unwilling to let it go and so that's part of a big part of the show and when that came out i always watched the show in a totally different way where i was just like huh. so i wonder if the real girl watching this totally realizes <laughs> that that's supposed to be her. And I wonder which parts of these things actually happen. I don't know. To me, that's kind of an interesting thing, but it's dangerous too. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. You, you've got to be better at disguising <laughs> these kind of things. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just one of those things that you run the risk of. If you're a friend of a writer, <laughs> you're going to find yourself in their stuff, uh, even if they've changed the, your name. I actually wrote a story called The Tenth Album, which uh, you have not read yet. But uh, I didn't even change people's names in it. Oh, really? <laughs> I had their names all the same. I think I will change them before I, I put it out finally. But yeah, I, it's based on this friend of mine that I have. And I just left his name in there as is and his wife's name in there as is and and so on. And yeah, I was just looking at that and I was thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to have to change that, I guess. I did change my name, though. My name was something else, so there's that. Huh. I had an uncle who was married to somebody who was famous, and a book was written by that famous person in which they changed my uncle's name to Joe or something like that because legally, I guess my uncle could have sued, or I, you know, I'm not sure, because they, they changed the name so there would be no... So that there would be no room for a lawsuit because it's like, oh, well, this is a, an invented character kind of thing. Right. And it talked about, you know, him being kind of an abusive a-hole and stuff like that. And everybody in my family knew that it was about our, my uncle. Uh -huh. And it was like, oh, and for a little while there was a, 
It was sensitive and it's like, oh, you know, don't read that book. But my In front of him. But my uncle died and they ended up making a movie of this book. And by the time that movie was made, my uncle had been gone long enough that they just used the real name. And that was upsetting to my mom because instead of it being Joe, suddenly it was the real name kind of thing, which is not exactly the same kind of thing. Well, maybe it is the same kind of thing. Because there was a lot of, of arguing of, of this could never have happened or this he wouldn't have done this or oh that has to be made up or or you know, maybe these are a combination of two different characters or people or, or things like that. But yeah, I've written lots of things where I incorporate entire incidents from your life or in, or or things that we have talked about or things, you know, people I know, it's obvious that's that person. And I guess it could be damaging to a friendship it could be a somebody's like hey that's a betrayal of confidence or what you know what i mean yeah you got to be careful i guess sometimes and i i suppose people probably don't realize this but they probably should realize that yeah if you're a friend with a person who creates things who writes uh stories screenplays etc it's fairly likely that in some way or other you're going to wind up in a story that they write as long as they are prolific enough but yeah, I think it's kind of cool, too, to be able to read through a story and realize, hey, hey, I think this is about me. This guy's kind of based on me, except for that he's a nerd, so that's totally not what I'm like. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, it's been very few times that I've found myself showing up in other people's writing. But uh, when I do, it's like, oh, cool, that's neat. But I, I can't speak for everybody. I'm sure there are people that would read something that I wrote and just hey that that's not cool man that's totally got to be me he's talking about and and yeah i don't know i guess it depends on the circumstance but in for a penny in for a pound if you've got a friend that's a writer and you want to stay friends with them you have to say you know okay i'm a psycho in this story that that eats children but in the next one you know i'm a heroic cop or something like that you know i i I don't know i do a story that eventually will show up on the show we were going to read it when we were done at the new media expo but we didn't have time And I also forgot to bring the printouts of it, which sort of made it harder. But yeah, I wrote a story where it was based on you and I as writers, except for your character was a Latin Lothario. Oh, that's right. And I remember in your comments for the story, you said, I hate when you have him do this because then I I don't think it's actually based on me anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I figured I had to change it up a little. I couldn't just blatantly, you know, make this character exactly you, so... Um, Muncie wrote Death and Michelle Jenkins, and he wrote Saying Goodbye. They're both pretty fixated on death and, and, and tragic and Michelle death. Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a Michelle Jenkins reference? In I don't think so, no. <laughs> uh, you know, that's interesting. I mean, I know he's written a lot of stories. You see his name show up on many, many podcasts. Yeah. But these two both have that element. I don't know. I, a lot of people don't want to think about death they don't want to be reminded that it's all going to end someday and i'm of two minds you know sometimes i like to hear people talk about pop music talk about pop music (laughs) (laughs) dooby dooby doo up pop pop boo up um i i do I, i like to hear people that are older you know looking back on their lives and they say hey i don't know how much more time i've got And so that's motivated me to to change my life or to do all these things or to say something to my loved one that I never would have said had I not been reminded of that. And of course, I told you about Kevin Smith's inspiring speech about realizing that there are fewer days ahead than there are behind and that you've got to surround yourself by people who say, why not? Instead of the people who will say, why? Why do you want to waste your time with that? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to take a chance? Or why not just, well, they, why? That one doesn't work. Yeah, that one doesn't work. I I recently listened to an interview with him where he told that story again, and he included more of the story than he did at the Comic-Con in 2011. And I was so glad I hadn't heard that version because what I took away from what he said at Comic-Con was that he is in his 40s and he's fat and, you know, he knows that his health is is not great and he knows that eventually – you know, that time is going to run out. The, 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 the sands through the hourglass are going to run out. And so he it's wanted... to be out of Chili's. Some guy's going to be telling a funny story and he's going to have a heart attack and die right there because he's 
just too fat. See that. That seems like, until I read this story, that seemed like it would be a pretty good way to go. He, <laughs> he d- died laughing. There you go. But it still sucked. Yeah, well. It still hurt, and he still fell, and he hit his head on the corner of the table. And uh, there's not a lot of dignity in dying, which sucks. But anyhow, w- what actually inspired Kevin to change his life or to be the why not guy was the death of his own father. And his brother was there when his father died, and he told him what it was like when dad died and it was just awful i mean just horrible you know there's no peace and no dignity and no oh he closed his eyes and then he was gone and oh geez that was terrifying to me and i i don't even know kevin's dad i don't even really know kevin all that well oh i hang out with his dad all the time oh wait his dad has died but to hear that intimate Description uh, to hear somebody talk about something that's private, that's that private, of how a loved one died. I, I it just it was too much. You know what I mean? It was it was too much into the shadows. I, I I needed to take a step back, and and I think had Kevin started his story at Comic Con with that, this is how my dad died, and when I heard it, I was terrified. I was like, holy smoke, I'm going to die too, and that's what death is like. I wouldn't have taken the inspiration from it that I that I took with him saying I'm getting older and who knows how much more time there's going to be and and death is lurking in the corner. So, I, you know, I was I was grateful. But but everybody has different things. You know, I mean, this story is about a person coming to terms with their own mortality, even though they're already gone. Right. But, you know, dealing with it and realizing and, and moving on and, and watching the wife do that as well, you know, or, or not even noticing that the wife has done that as well. Um, this seems like a story that you could give to somebody who had lost somebody and, and that would give them comfort. Uh, the, the, the final sentence of the story is, you know, he, he, he goes into the, he finally walks Walked into, into the, the light. light yeah. That's a hopeful way to to look at it. And it's, you know, these things that we tell ourselves so that we can deal in the middle of the night with the knowledge that it's all going to be over someday and someday soon. And so, yeah, I I, I don't know. It's, it's, It's interesting, the two deaths in these two stories that he sent us and talking about death and, and, and being around it and realizing that it's going to come for you. And, and, and I, I don't know. I mean, you having kids, I would assume that you hope that you'll die long before any of them do. I do. But that's, yes. but still, you don't want to hope to die. But yeah. And I also hope that it, I at least make it to the point that they've made it to adulthood before death comes along too. Um, unfortunately, you don't really get to choose when your death comes along. So you never know if that's going to happen or not. And I have a baby now. That is one year old, which means that I have to survive all that much longer. I guess hopefully this marathon will help me uh, get into shape enough that I'm less likely to die instead of more likely that the five guys we ate today has made me. Cannibalism is the leading (laughs) contributor to heart disease in this nation. See, my mom died before I made it to adulthood. Some of my older brothers and sisters had already made it that far, but then there were some of my younger brothers and sisters who were still a lot farther from it. And it affects you, and it's tough to deal with. So, yeah, I don't know. My dad had to go to the hospital last month. We were in Vegas for the New Media Expo, and my sister called and said, Dad is in the hospital. He couldn't breathe. He had some chest pains and that. And so I wanted to call to let you know. And I was by myself. I'd taken Marshall to the airport when this phone call came. And, and so I drove around for a few minutes and I, I was thinking. And and it's it's sick, not in the 21st century vernacular, but sick in the actual dictionary definition of the word. But I started thinking about what I would say at his funeral. Because uh, my, my dad and I haven't been close and I, you know, I've talked about him on the, the, the air, but it, you know, he, he did the best that he could. He had good intentions, even though I didn't agree with his methods. And, and I thought of a, a, a story of a really great thing he did when I was 10 years old or 11 years old. And I thought, that's what I'm going to tell at his funeral. If, if, if he's gone, I will tell that story 
because it was cool. It was it was a totally out of character thing for him to do for his son. And so I was like, oh, that's, that's the story I'm going to tell. And when we got back, I went and visited him in the hospital. He was there for three days and he was so grouchy and unhappy to be there and complaining to and then yelling at the nurses and all that, that it, there was no doubt in my mind that he was going to be fine because he was, I mean, just, you could tell, I mean, they all wanted him out of there. It's funny. He, he went to the same hospital that my sister was fired from as a nurse. And we, at one point he was visited by this nurse that had fired his daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so unpleasant to her that she wouldn't, that she would send the underlings to deal with him. She didn't, she wouldn't go in and all that. And, and I was just, that's him. And I, I actually found that not charming, but I, 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 it's just him. That's 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 him. They all, you know, shuddered when they walked past the the door, hoping that you know he didn't notice. And he would just everything was so poorly done, and nobody could please him. And that, and he just he was unpleasant to everybody. And I yeah, I only visited him the one time. As as dickish as that makes me sound, <laughs> but it's just there was no doubt in my mind this guy's going to be fine. We were going to drive his car back to to the house. And he's like, nobody is touching my car. And he's like, my keys are, I want to be able to see the keys at all times so that I can get out of here if I want to in the middle of the night. You know, I can pull these things out of my, my arm or whatever and leave if I want to. Nobody take my car. And it's just like, okay, if he's like that, he's going to be fine. It's it's when he starts becoming all sensitive. And he's like, as I look over my life, there are decisions <laughs> that I, that would have terrified me. I don't know. Anyhow, I guess I've been talking way too long, but, but we all, it's all going to, it's, it's going to happen for all of us. And I think we all have to prepare ourselves in different ways. Otherwise, I, I at one point, I think it's just going to be overwhelming and you're just like, oh no, oh no, oh no, I, 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 it can't, it's too soon. It's too, there's so many things I need to do. Maybe that's everybody though. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know that. I think it would be hard for it not to be overwhelming. No matter when it comes, it's going to be too soon, <laughs> probably. But yeah, it is something you have to prepare for. But the way to prepare for it is to live your life and, you know, do the best you can and be the why not guy and your mountain is waiting and get on your way guy and, you know, do the things that you need to do. Love the people that you love. Show them that you love them while you're still alive. So you don't have to be like, sorry. I never showed you love like I should have when I was alive and now it's too late, you know, when you're dying or something like that. So that if it turns out you're the guy who just gets hit by the car and knocked under the train, well, people already know you don't have to tell them you love them from your deathbed because you don't get one. I think that's kind of the way it is. You just got to do the best with the time that you have and that's how you prepare for the end of the time. I think in this story, the guy, I got the impression that his relationship with his wife was very good while he was alive, that they were loving and happy together, that they didn't have, that he didn't really have regrets. You know what I mean? Like he didn't think, oh boy, I, sh I, I just need to tell her that I love her because I didn't tell her when I was alive like I should have. He just kind of wanted to comfort her. And I guess that's a good place to be. It's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people would think of when they die. He wasn't, you know, trying to make up for shortcomings that he'd had in his life. He just wanted to give her one last bit of comfort before going. Then he realized it was unnecessary. So I guess the guy lived a good life despite it being very short. And uh, I guess we can take an example from him in that way. But when we die, just walk into the light. It's okay. I think Big is right. Getting cancer is much better than listening to you guys. <laughs> she, if he had hung around as a ghost, like any time a telemarketer called, he could have taken the call there you go. And, and just helped out his wife in that way. Could have been useful in that way. All right. Well, thanks for ending it on a, a light note because, yeah, we were getting pretty dark there. And I was <laughs> like, well, how are we going to segue into a story writing contest? game pretty much after this <laughs> right okay it looks like it's time for the drawing of the three rish it's about bloody time 
That, thank you, announcer man. Do you want to read some of these? Not on your life. Maybe, maybe if you ask, he'll... Do you want to read some of these, announcer man? Oh, hell no, Big Anklevich. Oh. All right. Okay, then. There was a door. <laughs> Why did you say that? Because <laughs> it's the drawing of three, man. We're about to open the door. <sighs> That's right. That, you know, we probably should have called it the drawing of the three contest, but... Triple word score is pretty fudge and great because I came up with it. But drawing of the three, that's not bad. <laughs> All right. So we're drawing the three now. We have many, many contestants. We're really actually pretty excited about the participation level we got this time around. Way better than any other contest we've ever done by like three times as many or more. I would say way more. I wouldn't say way better. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, I may have misspoke. Uh, so basically we'll just say your name. Your three words, and I say I quote unquote on words because sometimes they're multi-part words. And then if you would enjoy listening to our process of how we drew the words out of a hat, how some of them weren't appropriate words, <laughs> uh, we kind of had a laugh there for, for a couple of them and how it went on way too long. Go over to the blog, doonsteve.blogspot.com, and I think I will have put up the entire drawing of the three event on there in its own audio file. And you can listen to everybody's name called how the three words were drawn and various shenanigans along the way. Ooh, it's an event. All right. Okay. <laughs> Here comes the words. Ready? Go. Amber MacArthur. Your words are one hit wonder, something sinister, face. Sunny C, your words are outer space, desert, phonograph. Clay Dugga, your words are Sylvester Stallone, Andromeda Galaxy, hallucinogen. Zane Eddy, your words are hatch, dwarf, attack. John Ross, your words are windshield wipers, chew toy, brick. Tibby Scott, or could be Scott Tibby, I'm not quite sure on that one. Uh, your words are planet, despair, and blender. Marshall Latham, your words are starter, scarecrow, castle. Michael Gray, your words are students, porcupine, paperclip. Christopher Monroe, your words are Michael Jackson, <laughs> explosive, spook. Rob Broughton, Broughton, Bro Bro Broughton, the uh, Broughton. Your names are, words are, <clears throat> your words are, airplane bathroom, critic, flesh-eating bacteria. Oh, I was about to go bow chicka bow bow with airplane bathroom, but once you put flesh-eating bacteria in there, it changes. Makes it down a little, doesn't it? Andy Dilbeck, your words are flashcard, absolution, puppet. Uh, Catherine Inskip. Did I say that right? Is that the first female? Wait, what did... No, I think we had Tibby Scott. She's uh, that's probably a female, although if it's Scott, Scott Tibby, Tibby, then it yeah, isn't. Yeah. Catherine Inskip. Your words are invention, energizer bunny, notebook. I'm sorry, Catherine. <laughs> Brian Lincoln. Your words are scrapbook. Knife East Donovan Kachaki Kachase C A C A C E is how you spell your last name and you pronounce it in some way that I don't know. Paper cut Sasquatch Jays as in the bird, I believe. J A Y S Jays. 
Oh, see, I thought it was J Z, but you were pronouncing it as it's spelled. Ah. Uh, void Munashi. Your words are hairpin, cuisine, and snowman. Gino Moretto. Eggnog. Keyboard necktie. That's one concept there. Keyboard necktie. And soil. And Josh Roseman, your words are forklift, night with a K, K N I G H T, night, and jelly. She don't use jelly, she uses Vaseline. Sam Schreiber, your name is cool. Uh, your words are <laughs> glove, island, retina. Larby Gallagher, your words are angle, spear, orangutan. Daniel Latham, your words are haziness, wraith, with a W, and violet. Is there any other kind of wraith? Well, it's just, it sounds like rake or rape or rain, uh, Sam Raimi or, st- or okay. raid or, well, maybe it doesn't sound like any of those things. Except for all of those things end in a different letter. M. Curtis, your words are nail polish, sanitarium, gelatin. Zoom jink! <laughs> Julia Scott Douglas, your words are bolt, hunt, and walkie-talkie. Justin Call, I'm guessing that's how you say it, K-A-U-H-L. Your words are explosion, rotting wood, and death. (gasps) Folks, we got a winner here. Let's just just, (laughs) stop. Joseph Katz. Your words are bread, lozenge, and bachelor party. (laughs) That could be fun. I don't know. George Edwards. Your words are sponge, shorty, and Abraham Lincoln. Ooh. Robin C. Rutan. Your words are ventriloquist, nose, and tornado. Kevin Sargent, defenestration. That's not one of your words. It's my prediction for you. (laughs) No, actually, oddly enough, your words are defenestration, arrow, flashback. Dylan Stone, your words are headphones, candlestick, Colonel Mustard, bisque. The f*** is bisque. I told you, it was like a soup. Ah. Bria Burton, your words are violin, eeriness, and morbidly obese person. <laughs> Bo Hall, your words are rain, factory, and bandit. And that's rain, R-A-I-N. Adam Gifford, your words are mermaid, moth, and night. That's N I G H T night. Christian Thompson, your words are ancestor, shaver, and James T. Kirk. Jennifer Sarr, your words are groundhog, babies, and flatulence. Ooh, somebody doesn't like Jennifer. J.M. Perkins, your words are Kung Pao Shrimp, that's one word, King, and Gimp. Say it. Bring out the Gimp. Thank you. Jennifer Gifford, your words are Quiver, Winter, and Vampire. Jose Bill, Your words are Blade, Vets, and Avenue. 
Ryan Anderson, your words are mercury, electric chair, and bomb. Those aren't bad. William Carey, your words are aurora borealis, south, and endangered species. David Caffrey, your words are blood, horse, and Gandhi. And Amory Lowe, your words are antique, dozer, and haunting. Almost there. Hugh O'Donnell, your words are punk rock, mosquito, and craft. Do you always say the word mosquito, mosquito? Because you've Does said no it, one else say it that way? You said it twice now like that. I'm just curious. It's all right. <clears throat> Austin Malone, your words are trap, fodder, and squid. It's a trap! I think I, Indeed it may be. I think I blew the mic out there with that. A little over-modulated. Uh, Wendy Conroy, your words are vent, mammoth, and bathtub. Andrew O'Dell... Your words are blindness, crime, and spatula. And lastly, and probably least, Big Anklevich. Your words are agent, doppelganger, and avalanche. And Rish Outfield, your words are report, squads, and George Lucas. All right. So there you have it. Those are our words for our contest. Do your best with them. You have one month to write your story. It must be between 1,000 and 2,000 words. It must contain the three words that we gave you as your prompt. You have one month, so the deadline day, the drop-dead date that you must have your story turned in is May 15th. Send your story to submissions at doonstief.com and be sure to include the word submission in the slug of your story. Make it TWSC submission and then the title of your story and your name. Basically, what we're hoping for is the best story you can come up with that includes these items that are part of your words. So, you know, we want the words, the three words to be important to your story but we're not gonna judge this contest on who best integrates their words into their story it's more who writes the best story that includes these words that are integrated you know what i mean so good story is the number one criteria and you know moves down the line from there but if you totally cheat and don't really use your words you'll probably get marked down a point or more for doing so Okay, and you know, it's not too late to volunteer to read all of these stories and judge them. There are a lot, so it is kind of an obligation, but, but like, I, like we said, they're short stories. Right, yeah, they're going to be short, so it won't be as bad as it perhaps might seem. It might be way worse. <laughs> <laughs> if, you've got, if you're writing a story and you think you might be able to use a word in a tricky sort of way, again, th that's probably fine as long as you actually incorporate the word into your story. You know, we can do a word search for your three words once the story is complete and find all three. It's okay if it's, you know, a character is named king instead of an actual king, right? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, one thing that Rich was saying earlier that may have been cut out or may not have been cut out, if you have one of those double or triple word kind of words like flesh-eating bacteria or chew toy or something like that, those words uh, are the word. So flesh-eating bacteria must be, you can't have flesh in one place, eating in another place, bacteria in another place. They go together. Anything else? No. Hey, everybody, thank you for volunteering to enter this contest. There were way more people than we thought would do it. But yeah. in a way, it made me happy. That it's like, wow, we did something that lit the imaginations of a lot of folks up. Yeah, really excited by the level of participation this time around. Just the amount of people that signed up this time around just kind of blew me away and really makes me want to do more contests in the future because you know people seem to care they they want to be a part of it and that's really cool really exciting 
Okay, one last thing. We haven't decided how many of these stories we're going to run on the show. So if there are 10 just fudging awesome stories, we're going to run 10 fudging awesome stories. If there's two that are really good and all the rest suck, then it's just going to be me and Big, really, that run our, our own story. For <laughs> yeah, so uh, usually that's kind of what we use as the cutoff. We're like, yeah, these are so-so. But from here up are, are our favorites, and we'll go with you know whatever that is, whatever that level is. It's not just our favorites, by the way. We will have everybody vote on the stories and then average out the votes, I think. Yep, that's right. And, and so all the readers will read them, and they will give them scores between 1 and 10. And the highest averages are the ones that will win, that will get produced on the show. If you want to uh, produce one of these short little stories, too, let us know. We'll put you on a list. And uh, we'll send them all out. You know, there are people that are that want to produce, but they don't want to tackle a Catastrophe Baker story or something that's massive, that's going to be full of sound effects and, and physical pleasures. They want uh, <laughs> yeah, something like this, a 1,500-word story. You know, that's not going to take the rest of your month to produce. So, so uh, yeah, if you would like to be a part of that, too, go ahead and volunteer. Uh, hey, one last thing. Uh, I don't know if we have time. Do we have time? Uh, it looks like we just got a, a minute. Do it fast. Okay. Oedo T is just going to turn this off. <laughs> He's going to cut hurry. my mic like That's an right. Oscar acceptance speech. <laughs> I wanted to plug a story that I got to narrate over at uh, the Cast of Wonders podcast. Okay. It's over at castofwonders.org. And they are like a sister podcast to the old uh, Cast Macabre. Ah, podcast okay. that I think we participated in a couple uh -huh. of times back when it existed. They're like the twin sister that like in the womb ingests the other sister and becomes the only one like that. I, You know, I read a statistic of it was like a horrifying statistic of how many babies that happens to. Yeah. And it's like, oh, <laughs> oh. anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> it's run by Graham Dunlop, who I know has read for us on this show. And uh, he asked me to read while, this huh? story. Yeah, it's been a while. It's too bad. He should come back. It's got a delightful accent. Uh, he asked me to read a story called Cosmetic Procedures. When we were at the New Media Expo, we all performed a story of mine called Office Visit. And... This story was really, really similar to that in kind of an, oh, wow, this is weird how close this is in ways. There's a private investigator and he is approached by a, a client, a man who has been having difficulties with his wife. And it's not the normal difficulties, you know, with a cheating wife or anything. She's changed. She's not who she used to be. Her behavior has totally been altered by something. And so he does an investigation and they discover, yeah, that there is something unexplainable going on but it's it turns out to have a very banal source you know something that shouldn't be scary or threatening and yet it is and so, it's so for me i mean i know nobody has heard office visit yet but it would be just a really fun compare and contrast kind of story but boy it was it was really fun to read and most importantly, there was one line of dialogue in that story where the second I got to it, I knew why Graham had asked me to record the story. <laughs> I laughed and I think I had to do it like three times before you could get the smile out of my face, <laughs> out of my voice rather. And I think anybody that goes there and listens to the story, cosmetic procedures will recognize that line if they're a fan of this show. And, say, and and they'll laugh too. So It took them three days just to get the smile off his face. Yes, that's how I want to go. <laughs> We've been talking about death. That's the source. So, uh, yes, I, I, I thank you for indulging me on that. All right. Okay, so we've uh, run our course. And my butt hurts from sitting on this hard kitchen chair. So we're going to go ahead and end this show. Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks, uh, Muncie, for participating in our contest. Thanks, Melissa, for producing this story, which was really well done. Came out really nicely, and I was very impressed. This was her very first production. So See, yeah, I really find that good. hard to believe. Yeah. Because uh, as I was listening, it wasn't with a critical ear, 
but I tend to listen for, oh, that didn't work, or oh, uh, mostly because I narrated the story, and so I'm super critical of myself. I pick up on little mistakes that hopefully other people don't pick up on. They weren't there in this one. Yeah, so. Yeah, so it was really it well done. And with thanks to Mustafa uh, for scoring this story. It was, uh, what an awesome uh, addition. We really enjoyed that. Thanks to everyone who's listening, who listened all the way to the end and all our chatter. And uh, we'll see you again next time. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Why not? Yeah. Okay. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone... But you cannot change it or make money off it. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. I'm gone. Take two. How much of this story came from the prompt Big and Rish gave, and how much came from a previous story or idea you had thought of in the past? Uh. Fascinating. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, I was supposed to be playing the part of Munzi, so I will read his answer. <laughs> Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No, that's not true. That's impossible. You can destroy the Emperor. It is your destiny. Join me and together we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. All right, let's give it a shot.